now as we move into the rewards of discipleship, the reminder uh, for all of us is that, have you discipled anyone? Are you currently a Timothy or a Paul? Uh, that check has everyone here, I hope, on the uh, call has been through Operation Timothy, and that you also have taken at least one other person through Operation Timothy. We know that uh, as we get focused on discipleship, it's all about the impact of life on life discipleship, which really impacts the church, the culture, and the kingdom. And Jesus modeled that for us. One of the great things about Operation Timothy is it's, uh, it is life on life. It is uh, investing your, your blood, sweat, and tears into the lives of other people that they then are impacted and therefore then their families and uh, their co-workers on before that. The reminder again, the great commandment, we looked at that part of it and just for a little bit different twist, we talked about the fact that loving your neighbor as yourself really is evangelism. And sometimes I've had someone make the comments, well, I don't really see strong enough that strong statement like the Great Commission is about making disciples. But when Christ was asked about uh, the Pharisees asking him, and he says, loving your neighbor is yourself, that is evangelism. And we want that to be a joyful experience. The part of making disciples, as we know, it's, uh, it's as we're going. So it's that day-to-day. -day. It's the person God has entrusted to you that day and put in front of you that you build that relationship with them. Remember this term, we used this uh, last week as well in the, uh, in the military. If you disobey the order of a commander, it's insubordination. If you take authority away from the captain of the ship, it's called mutiny. And it's called to disobey the commander, the captain, the creator, the, uh, the Lord of all. And we use the term there, we're a little harsh, but betrayal. Betrayal, uh, we say, because we are supposed to represent him in all that we do. We're now adopted into his family, and it's uh, so significant that we do it. So if we're going to make disciples, if we're going to bear fruit, more fruit and much fruit, that is life on life uh, discipleship taking place. So why do we disciple? I'm gonna move my uh, this screen out of the way here. Think about this for a second. Evangelism changes a person's eternal destination. Discipleship confirms their new identity, transforms their character, and transforms them into a useful vessel in the hand of the creator for his glory. Certainly, the new destination is very important. But just sneaking into heaven is not where we're going to be able to look at and see the rewards of discipleship. The rewards come about as we've been obedient in showing our love for Christ by being a disciple and making disciples. And so we do it to honor and glorify him, to be obedient, and to allow someone new, this new identity, when someone comes from outside the body of Christ into the body, and they have to learn who they really are in Christ. This whole new identity, as you know, one of my favorite chapters in Operation Timothy is that chapter on understanding our new identity, being seen from God's perspective as who he says we are, rather than who we think we are. So why disciple? We know that it, uh, it pleases the heart of God. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. And his commands is to go and make disciples as we are going. And we hear it, but it's so easy, it seems at times, to put that off and not put the, uh, the building time it takes to build relationships so that you can invest in another person. So we also talked on the evangelism side, there were three C's, if you recall, I'm going to remind you of those. It was compassion. Christ showed great compassion. 
it was being compelled by the love of Christ, and it was committed. So those were the three C's to keep in mind, and we looked at verses around that on why the joy of evangelism is so significant. Here we're going to look at uh, similar in that why a disciple. Uh, first of all, we've been called a disciple. It's purpose to our lives. We want to present others mature in Christ. We know that through that, we grow into maturity as we pour our life into others. As we're helping them mature, God is using that process to mature us. The uh, statement here from Colossians and Paul, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Think right now and just what's going on in your communities and your part of the world and mine, the lack of hope. It, it is just everywhere. And yet Christ says that, that in him, we get to really fully understand this hope of glory and we're to share that. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. That's the real definition of discipleship, presenting others fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. We know that when we focus on making disciples and building in the relationships and maturing them into the word of God and their identity in Christ, that the power of God is available to us to work in those lives. We're not doing it on our own. Sometimes we feel like we are. Sometimes when people don't want to continue and do the, uh, the lessons, they don't want to meet, they, they push back. But I, I encourage you, brothers, understand the deep hunger that really is there. It may be mixed with fear. The unknown uh, scares lots of us. But there's no need to be fearful in helping someone grow into Christ, just the opposite, as we know. So we've been called. We've been commissioned. This idea of, uh, as God has, has commissioned us, to go out and represent him. He's commanded us. We'll go back to that in a second. We know those verses in Matthew uh, uh, 28, 19 and 20, John 14, 15, when we started. But this love and obedience and this willingness of our heart to want to please him and bless the heart of God, he's commanded us to go and make disciples. It's not a mystery. The calling and chosen for it is so exciting as we've been called into the family of God, but we haven't been called there to just uh, jump in and, and take a piece out of the kingdom and think, well, I'm just going to enjoy the kingdom. No, he's commissioned us to go and actually be part of building the kingdom. Remember, he has given us all authority, and often we, uh, we seems we stay away maybe from higher up professionals, uh, those that, that may be above, if you will, our pay grade, they are just as desperate to know Christ as we were when we first came to Christ. They may not admit it, but you and I have been given the authority to speak Christ into their life and to help them grow into maturity, empowered to complete ministry. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases, Luke 9.1. Colossians 1.25 says, I have become its a servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. We think about officers in the uh, armed forces being commissioned. We see in our churches, someone's going to get sent out in ministry and we commission him. But you and I have been commissioned one uh, relationship to another, first with Christ and then to others to carry out the Great Commission, to go and make disciples. 
And it's so easy sometimes to uh, let that slip away from us, it seems. Jesus command again. And Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. We're not going to do this on our own. We're going with his full authority of heaven and earth to go and do it. And we're to, as we are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. As we see what's going on in the world, are we moving towards the end of the age? Yes, but we don't know how long that is. But we do know we have a personal assignment from God to go and make disciples at all levels in all of those God has entrusted to us. So this term, disciple, Jesus used the Greek a word, methetes, meaning a learner, one who follows another's teaching and an imitator of the teacher. How much time do we spend? We talked last uh, week how we have to start out the day in the word, listening to the Holy Spirit, praying with power, getting our directions for the day, our instructions. And it's not talking about going out and making converts. That is evangelism. It's talking about turning someone around, the turnabout to turn to God and really get to know him, to really get to understand him and love him. That's who disciples are, and that's who we are to be. Go. We've talked about that already. Great commission here. Let's uh, look at this, a statement by Robert Coleman out of the book, if you haven't read it, The Master Plan of Discipleship. It says, the great commission is not a special calling or gift of the Spirit. It is a command, obligation incumbent upon the whole community of faith. Imagine if the entire body of Christ took this seriously and with, went into our churches for getting equipped and out into the marketplace making disciples, really speaking into their lives, really investing into those relationships. And notice there's no exceptions. Bank presidents and automobile mechanics, physicians and school teachers, theologians and homemakers, everyone who believes on Christ has a part in his work. And I'm sure y'all hear it in uh, South Africa, the way we do in our uh, churches here, it can get almost to the point, well, that's the pastor's job, or that's the deacon's job, or the elders, instead of it's the entire obligation and responsibility of the body of Christ. Now, we get a different form of joy from that. Uh, I'm sure y'all will agree with me. There's nothing more joyful than watching somebody else come to Christ except watching them to grow in Christ and then watch them go share that with someone else and go invest in other lives. And so when we really live that out, remember to do it not in our authority and our power, but in the authority that Christ has, which he's given to us, indwelling us by the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out the disciple-making process. So we know here's something that's not. It's not just teaching. It's not just curriculum. It's not just uh, uh, Sunday school classes. What it really is, and you all have experienced this, it's the process of helping one grow in Christ. It's two people walking side by side. I'm going to, we get towards the end, I introduce you to a man who was my Paul. His name is Felix. And he came alongside and, and walked with me for two years as a brand new babe in Christ. And it impacted my life to this day. It has never stopped having an impact in my life. So this discipleship in the context of relationships is what it's about. We saw part of this chart last week. We saw the first part, the evangelism side. And the reminder here on the second part is 
once someone is in Christ and actually experiences a new birth, now in a new birth, we're not talking about someone who just believes in God. We know Satan himself believes in God. We are talking about someone who has really surrendered their life to Christ. They've confessed their sin, and they have turned around and going back towards God. At that point, they're a babe in Christ. But so often we think, well, okay, they're on their journey now. Uh, they're doing great. And boy, they are not doing great. It's just the, belief, the beginning of this journey for the new believer. They're really saying to us, help me. Help me understand who God is. Help me know the scriptures. Spending time with them and their family and knowing them. Fragile, dependent, incapable of discerning danger. Have you ever started with a Timothy and he's asking some questions about <coughs> things that uh, he's thinking about doing and you're thinking to yourself, oh, you don't want to go there. You don't want to start down that road. That's a great way to stumble and fall back on your face again. So he is fragile. He needs a Paul who will provide consistent loving attention while spoon feeding him God's word. That's where all new believers start out. And we see so many that come to a point they pray to receive Christ, but there's no one to walk along with them in this journey. Then the, the next stage, the, the toddler, if you will. And we noticed that in the evangelism side, those were all farming terms. And we were talking a little early about farming and y'all just having finished your harvest season. And so in the evangelism side, it's, it's preparing the soil and sowing and reaping. So those are farming terms. Here we're talking about parenting terms when it gets into discipleship. So they say that's curious, impressionable, beginning to feed himself, but lacks discipline. They need Paul who will nurture and teach him who he is in Christ, this new identity of walking with him. And you know, it, it takes a long time. This is not, well, let's just go through the booklet and we've got that covered. Uh, with our Lord Jesus himself, we know he walked with the disciples for over three years. And he invested and poured into them. He ate, drank, slept, shared Old Testament scriptures, shared life, shared God's purpose and vision. So it was an ongoing journey. Well, if it took the Lord and Savior three years, how many does it take us? This third, this adolescent stage, we've all been there. Able to reproduce, but still self-centered. It's still about me. And that we have to be so careful there that we get our eyes off of ourselves and on to being a useful vessel for God to work through. Needs a Paul to show him how to witness, study, pray, and help establish biblical boundaries and accountability. I, I wonder in your own examples of, of those you've been discipling, do you know their wives? You know their children? Have you been to their house for dinner and them to yours? Uh, as Operation Timothy, when you watch some of the movies, it recommends to sit and watch together and have discussions around it. Uh, doing that as couples together with he and his wife, it really builds a much deeper bonding relationship. So it's not just about checking a box. It's about getting invested in their lives. And we want everyone to come to this part of uh, being mature, becoming a disciple maker, demonstrates a consistent walk of faith and able to reproduce care and nurture a babe starting the process all over again to the third and fourth generation. That's really what Christ is calling us to do. Needs a Timothy who will grow and reproduce, and I trust and hope that you have those experiences in the men's lives you've been investing in, and if you haven't, and if you haven't ever been discipled yourself, ask one of the guys to get involved and, and take you through. And shortly as you're on that journey, then you can start with your own Timothy. Again, how do we make disciples? Teaching them to obey all I have commanded. Teaching them to obey, modeling it, showing it to them, 
doing all of those steps together, just like our Lord and Savior did. So great picture here, a reminder of him doing life with them. Our question is, looking at the time we're in, it's really challenging to do life together the way we'd like to, face to face. So what other creative ways can we do it? We're using one now with Zoom. Uh, we talked last week about when's the last time you wrote a letter to someone, uh, the phone calls, praying for your top 10 list, finding things that you can read together and discuss over the phone. And shortly, we'll be able to all get back face to face together. But here's a, uh, a, a, a picture here of how Jesus did it. So we see that instruction, and that's going through and working through uh, the scriptures with them. Instruction is important. It's important for them to see how we do life and uh, not that we're uh, greater than anyone else. We're still maturing ourselves and we need to always remember that. They, uh, they ate with him. They walked and talked together. They spent what we've been talking about, precious time together. And the interesting thing about when you invest into one person's life, we have found from studies, you're impacting a minimum of 20 people. The rest of his family, hopefully uh, you're impacting, obviously within his immediate family, with his wife and his children, those at work, those in your community. So if every time we invest in one life, which is businessmen, we say, wait a minute, that plan can't work. That's just, that's not, I need numbers. Give me big numbers. Jesus didn't do big numbers. He did great multiplication. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Apprenticing is really showing it. If you haven't gone out uh, lately on a call with your Timothy and uh, done evangelism together and let him see that in action, Boy, that's, that's really encouraging. This uh, being accountable to the Father to whom much is given, much is required. We have an accountability responsibility as kids of the kingdom, as men God has personally called and chosen. So let's recap a little bit. <coughs> Make life-on-life -life relational investments. Our 10 most wanted cards, a great place to start. Uh, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to disciple any of the guys on your 10 most wanted card. Hopefully first you've led them to Christ or you've seen them come to Christ and then come alongside and ask them to allow you the privilege of walking through the scriptures with them. Get involved with Timothy's family. I must say for the first few years, I didn't do that. I focused on the man and he can tell me how things are going at home and how things are working out with him as a father. But until I go and spend time with him and see him in the role and how he's actually living it out, I really don't know how he's doing. Demonstrate love with action to encourage and mature another. Asking our Timothys to help us to continue to grow. We will never in this life stop growing, stop maturing, if we're doing it the way God designed it. We will always be learning more, getting closer, understanding Father better, loving him more, and so on going. This teaching the word and modeling the life of Christ, we know Paul made some really bold statements. Uh, follow me, model me, do as I've done. Uh, we hesitate sometimes, it seems, to think about in that way, I'm going to live so close with Christ that I can be able to be a true model of who he is and his power that's working within us, that authority. Pray for your Timothy and family, of course, and then joining in with them for times of prayer, whether that's on a phone together or a Zoom call, and getting the whole family involved. We help them become mature in Christ. Again, Colossians 1, and 29. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery. The glorious mystery. It is glorious. The world is so confused. 
they're so upside down at trying to understand who God is and how to know him and walk with him. We could proclaim lots of things, but what's important to proclaim is the truth of the gospel. Remember we talked about we have to possess it, we have to protect it, and we have to proclaim it. That's what we have to do with the word of God, and that's all part of admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So we we look at the uh, continuation to this, this uh, next step. Again, the picture that life on life, I need to be involved with them. I need to spend time with them. It's not just getting together once a week for an hour and a half. It's totally involvement in their life. Uh, discipleship is uh, hard work. Instruction, we must give them instruction in the Word of God. Again, we've talked about this, the life on life, getting involved in it. Those common ground events, sporting events, going over and help them do yard work, whatever we need to do to get into that man's life and know his family and encourage him, that's what we need to be able to do. We need to demonstrate it for them through this apprenticing, coming alongside of them, and the accountability again. As iron sharpens iron, challenge. Memorize in scripture, devotions together. One of the things I just started doing within the last few years, when I'm uh, taking one, someone through Operation Timothy, I get them the same devotional. So we get to share the devotional throughout the week. I know what one of the things he's reading, we may talk about what scriptures we're gonna read together, so that we're uh, then having this continuing conversation and communication about studying the same things together. This is, uh, we uh, again tied this last week to Galatians 2.20, that first we have to be crucified with Christ. And we know that then it's now, the life I now live is Christ living in me and through me. Now he's given us a new life. Our next role is to offer it back to him. The spiritual transformation. Therefore, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Boy, that's hard. The culture is hitting us so hard. And it wants to conform us into the culture's way of thinking, away from a biblical worldview, into a secular worldview, which is completely lost in a mess. But we're we're commanded here, we're instructed, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How many times have you uh, been talking with someone, with one of your Timothys, and he said, oh, I just knew the will of God, if I could just know it. And we can Go ahead and take them into the scriptures and show them how to know the will of God. Lots of scriptures about knowing the will of God. But first, it takes this act of offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. It's no longer our life. And then, then be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So, a little refresher. Worldview. We talked uh, again last week about working there, compelled by the love of Christ, not to count sins, men's sin against them anymore. Uh, we can fall into the trap within the body of Christ, just like so many do, that we look at behavior instead of looking at the heart. This, if we're going to really impact someone's life, it starts with helping them gain a biblical worldview, which changes their values, which changes their behavior. It's not the other way. So our behavior has consequences. They affect our relationships. Biblical worldview, growth and change coming from the inside out, changes a person completely, his family, his community, his workplace. Biblical worldview. Operation Timothy is not the only way to do it. 
It's just as far as I know the best way to do it. Haven't found anything that's any better. So it's a track to run on. It keeps us focused. Book one is about life questions. Book two, life foundations. And book through life's perspective. And it keeps us on a track. That doesn't mean on a given week, uh, our Timothy's dealing with some real personal issues and we need to stop and help him work through that and walk through that. But don't let that become a weekly occurrence because we have to build the foundation. Then he learns through the Holy Spirit to make his own decisions, to get wisdom from God himself, to dig into the scriptures. But if all we do is talk about problem solving and not building a solid foundation, then we miss it. <coughs> Pardon me. All right. Um, I'm sure you all know that all of this is available online. Uh, the Marketplace uh, Advancement System, as we briefly touched on last week, we're going to be adding new languages to it. They're in process now, so that hopefully by the end of the year, we will have added uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French, uh, Swahili, and uh, Alex, I just went blank, but we'll get there. It'll come back to this old mind in a moment. But all of that will be available as well. Monday Mana will be available on there, and we're going to have a subset for CBMC International with all the same information. So that's in process. Reminder, God's word is key. It's the equipping. And we know this verse, I know you know it, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And out of Timothy 2.2, 2, we know that we are to be investing in people's lives to the third and fourth generation. We want to help them know how to apply God's word to their life helping them get a real grip on it. This is an example out of OT. We're to hear the word. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the body of Christ, that's as far as they go. They hear the word. They hear it from the, the pulpit on Sunday. Maybe they listen to uh, 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 on their iPhone or uh, uh, seeing some uh, podcasts there. Reading the word, daily reading the word. And then this third part, guys, study. When's the last time that you studied to the point you learned something new in scripture? Because you've been digging in and studying the word. Memorizing scripture, we know how important, how significant that is. God tells us that he doesn't want us to sin against him. We need to hide the word of God in our heart. And then taking the time, hopefully these last couple of months, actually we've all had a lot of time to meditate on the word of God to really dig in at a deeper level. And uh, I hope that's ongoing. And I hope you're encouraging your Timothy and you may need to do it with him and get alongside of him in these times where we're uh, not face to face. Mm -hmm. The disciple's ability to apply God's word to his life reflects the effectiveness of the discipling experience. If your Timothy and ourselves cannot apply the word of God to direct our lives, we're not spending enough time there, and we're not asking God to give us clear direction and understanding. So what do we give our life to? Giving your life in exchange for people means getting involved in the gut issues of life. And boy, there are a lot of gut issues, aren't they? And we brought a lot of them into it ourselves. People can be superficially involved in teaching classes or committee work, or programs without any heart involvement. Discipleship is an act of the heart. It's having God's heart first for the lost and God's heart that we then love and obey him by bearing fruit, more fruit and much fruit. So how did Paul describe it? Out of 1 Thessalonians, here's the parenting example we're talking about with discipleship. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes, cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. 
as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What a challenging reminder of how Paul was living his life also in very challenging and difficult times. This idea of the, of the mother caring for that baby, the dad teaching his children how to ride, we're, we're doing that when we're involved with these different lives. It's all life on life. Spiritual reproduction, uh, guys, this, just, this model uh, just is amazing. It works, and I'll show you a practical one in just a minute. I'm watching our time here. The things which you have heard me, heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Think about that part for a minute. We use this verse all the time. You've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Obviously, Paul is sharing the gospel, investing in people's lives right in the crowds, right in the middle of many witnesses. Now, there's other witnesses as well. We have a lot of great heavenly witnesses we know from Scripture that are watching the work that we're doing on behalf of Jesus Christ. Wow. So we're to entrust these truths, these words, this Scripture, who will be able to teach and also others also. So they're going to carry it on. So we have you or me, a Paul with a Timothy, faithful men investing into others. They continue to invest in others. And sometimes I know we all get frustrated in that. Well, the Timothy just dropped it. He didn't keep going. This week, after being convicted with being with y'all last week, and the joy of evangelism, a young man I'd led to Christ and he disappeared, I went and tracked him down. And we're now getting together over the phone and then going to get face-to-face -face sitting outside in a coffee with coffee because we can't let go of them. We need to stay there. Now, I mentioned I was going to introduce you to someone. The guy who discipled me is Felix Kenny. And speaking of farmers, he was a mint farmer from Yakima, Washington, way up in the northwest corner of the U.S. And Felix invested in my life when I came to Christ. So I was his, not his first Timothy. He had many Timothys. When Felix went home to be with the Lord about nine years ago now, there were over 200 men at his memorial who he had invested his life into. Uh, he brings to life this scripture verse at the bottom, one shall become a thousand. And that's what God would have for our life. And he challenged me. And this is not about me, guys. This is about Felix. He challenged me that I would spend the rest of my life, as long as I was on this earth, discipling men. That's what I was called to do as a disciple of Christ. And so these are some of the people in the first generation who uh, they don't want to invest in their lives. But picture this, this one vine comes down up here with uh, Felix. He had multiple vines like that. And he encouraged all of them to go and bear fruit and to carry out the great commission and make disciples. Then there's those that have gone on to <clears throat> second and third generations. There's guys that have gone on to fifth generations. They're out there, and I haven't updated this in a while. There's six and seven generations out there, and this all comes to Felix being a faithful follower of Christ, being a disciple, making disciples. It is so encouraging, and I hope it's encouraging for you. It's not enough just to be a branch of the vine. We must abide in Christ and become a branch that bears fruit. So, roundtable discussion coming up. I uh, want to back up one. Hold one second. So we call it rewards of discipleship. Why? I'm sure you're familiar with the Bema Seat of Christ. Not talking about the white throne judgment. We're talking about the believers to go before Christ and have our life reviewed with him one-on-one. -on -one. Everything that's wood, hay, and stubble gets burnt up coming off the conveyor belt. 
Only that which brought glory to Christ, which shows our obedience to follow through. And at that Bema seat, we either lose rewards or we gain rewards. So these are some of the rewards that scripture says we have. The crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of life, the incorruptible crown, and the crown of rejoicing. And when you go back and you look at those scripture verses and tie it together, guess what's at the heart of all of it? Discipleship. Making disciples, bringing honor and glory to Christ. Being faithful as a follower of Christ, who not only has the joy of evangelism, but he also has the rewards of discipleship. <clears throat> so these are some roundtable discussion questions you could uh, uh, go into the, uh, the, the private rooms with. Again, the reminder, how did Jesus make disciples? Am I doing it that way? Did it work? Has each member of your team been through Operation Timothy? Discuss in your table ways to make this happen if it hasn't. And as you go back to your various teams around South Africa, making certain that all of you guys have been discipled and are making disciples. You want them to uh, be able to obtain the rewards at the Bema seat. With three steps you need to take to impact your team, then your city to build and equip disciple makers. So that brings us to, uh, to a close on the discipleship. Frick has the uh, originals of all of this and can send these uh, workshops to you to use with your different teams to review it. Uh, I, my prayer for all of you as it is for our teams here is that in this uh, time of challenge, that we would be faithful in showing the love to our Savior and being obedient and making disciples and being joyful evangelists. And when we do all of that, it just fills our life to overflowing, doesn't it? <laughs>